So in my first video about this uh, ARM2 CPU that I've got to play with, I explained how it needs a two-phase clock and uh, made a simple circuit to generate the two-phase clock and showed the CPU in action, uh, just flashing some LEDs uh, based on the low bits of the address bus. What I want to do in this video is uh, catch you guys up a bit more on some of the research that I did into how to use this chip while I was waiting for it to be delivered, and hopefully that'll give you guys a better grounding in what's going on when I try to hook up more functions of the CPU in the next videos. I'm not planning to edit this much, so apologies if it is rather rambly, but I'll probably include some shots of the data sheet and so on if it helps, uh, if I think it'll help you guys understand what I'm talking about. So once again, this breakout board is something that I designed while I was waiting for the CPU to be delivered, and for the most part it breaks every single pin of the chip out to a separate pin on the board. Um, the exceptions are the power pins, which I uh, which I connected all together, and they're routed through to this connector at the top here for the plus 5 volts and ground. So I thought it'd be good to give you guys a quick tour of the board, explaining what all of the pins are, um, and, to, and, and to the best of my knowledge what they're for. So in the last video we already saw the power pins at the top here being connected, that's a plus 5 volts and a ground. Uh, the CPU actually has a pair of pins on each corner for power. In fact, the ARM1 had a pair of pins on each corner for power and ground. This is the ARM2, which is revised, and they repurposed a couple of those pins for the coprocessor interface. So that's not quite true anymore. I've still put one capacitor on each corner um, where, the, where the power connections are. I don't know how important that is. Uh, but then the power connections are all just kind of joined together and routed to that uh, jumper at the top with an extra electrolytic capacitor. And that bulk capacitor is mostly there to uh, counteract any variance in the voltage being supplied from the wires due to changing power requirements of the CPU. These are actually incredibly low power CPUs anyway, so I wouldn't really expect much trouble there. But it's good practice to put some bulk decoupling capacitance uh, any time you route power from one board to another. Other pins we used in the last video were these two pins at the top of the CPU here. These are the clock pins, phase 1 and phase 2. I put those very close to the actual CPU because it's a clock signal, it felt like the right thing to do. Probably doesn't matter very much at the frequencies I'm doing here, but um, I also tried to route the neighbouring traces ar around it, giving plenty of leeway. But again, the same frequencies are basically visible on pretty much all the pins, so that's probably a bit futile. We also hooked up the bottom eight bits of the address bus down here. Um, what else did we do? And um, there's one of the pins here that I had to connect up as well. I think I think that's about it from what I did in the last video. But anyway, let's go around the whole board and just explain what everything is. So all the way down the right hand side here, and halfway along the bottom, is a 32-bit data bus, uh, which is incredibly wide when you're used to a 8-bit bus on the 6502. That's a lot of pins to deal with, um, and we are going to have to connect them all up. And part of the reason for that big wide data bus is that one of the prime design constraints that the Acorn engineers were bearing in mind when they designed the CPU, in fact one of the main reasons they designed the CPU in the first place, was because they were unhappy with the degree to which competing CPUs at the time made use of the faster memory that was becoming available in the mid-80s. And this is something that they'd seen when they were assessing these competing CPUs uh, to see whether they wanted to use them in their next desktop computer. So a lot of the features of the first iterations of the ARM CPUs were very much designed with that in mind. Um, that led to a bunch of compromises for the sake of uh, providing better access to that kind of bandwidth. Some of those design decisions definitely didn't age well. But at the time they made those decisions for good reasons and uh, in fact produced the fastest microcomputer on the planet when it came out. So that did pay off, at least in the short term. The way the ARM actually accesses the data bus, it is a 32-bit bus cycle, so uh, its default mode of operation is to pull 32 bits of data at a time from memory and write 32 bits back to memory. Um, these uh, memory accesses have to be uh, word aligned as well, so you, the address bus almost always has a multiple of four on it, um, except in the very rare occasions that it is addressing a single byte of memory. I'll talk more about that in a sec when I get to some of the other control pins. So continuing around the bottom of the board, we have the address bus. Uh, there are 26 pins on the address bus. It's a 26-bit address bus. I think that's enough for 16 megabytes, um, maybe 64. I think it's 16. 
And again, this was a compromise, I think, to keep the pin count of the package down to fit inside the 84 pin package that they were targeting here, um, probably for cost reasons. And we'll come back a little bit to that later on because there's also some sort of internal architecture that's also based around this 26-bit data bus uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, later editions of the ARM CPU obviously did extend this address bus to 32 bits. I think that was ARM 6 that that happened in. ARM 6 was the one after ARM 3. They skipped a few numbers. And ARM 3 is the one after this one. And that was very much at a time when they were looking to market this CPU to uh, other manufacturers uh, making their own computers. Continuing around the board again then, just above the address bus here, I've put three uh, bus control pins. Uh, the one on the left is address latch enable. Then we have, I think that's address bus enable and data bus enable. I might have got them in the wrong order. I can't read the writing from here. So address bus enable and data bus enable do pretty much what you'd expect. When these pins are low, uh, the, address p the address bus or the data bus go to the high, high impedance state and that allows other chips on the buses to uh, become bus masters. Uh, address latch enable is a bit more interesting though. So even when the arm is driving the address bus, it has an option here to uh, keep a consistent value on the address bus or update it as soon as it knows what the next address it's going to need to read is. Technically you could tie this pin high all the time which would mean that the uh, which would mean that the ARM2 constantly advertises the addresses as soon as it knows what they're going to be. But because of the way the pipelining works, that can actually make accessing some devices tricky because some devices uh, don't internally latch the address that, that the CPU is asking for. So if we're interfacing with those devices, you might want to uh, bring the address latch enable pin low for some of the bus cycle just to make sure that the address on that bus is held on that bus for a little bit longer so that those chips can carry on and output the right values. So the reason they wanted to do this was again due to the wanting to make the best use possible of memory bandwidth. Working with dynamic RAM, um, under, under some conditions it can take longer to fetch data from the memory than others, and in those conditions they wanted to make sure that the address that was going to be fetched from was advertised to the bus as early as possible to allow that fetch cycle to start as soon as possible. It's not so important for static RAM, um, partly because static RAM doesn't latch the address in the same way and doesn't have the same page mode operation. But we'll talk a bit more about page mode, I guess, in a bit as well. Moving along here, the next three pins inside here are kind of interrupty pins. Uh, we have the IRQ pin on the right-hand side, which behaves very much like a 6502. It's active low, and whenever that's low, uh, the CPU enters an IRQ state. Actually, it might be edge-triggered on this one, I can't remember. The next one along is FIQ. Um, that's like a that, that that stands for fast IRQ, and it works in pretty much the same way, but it puts the CPU in slight in a slightly different mode and calls a different interrupt vector or something like that. And the other pin from those three is the reset pin, which I lumped in with the IRQs. Um, I'm not sure why it's not really an IRQ, but anyway, that's the reset pin. Uh, that needs to be held low, except when you're resetting. I think it's active high, which is the opposite of the way it is in the 6502. I mentioned the clock pins already. Over here we have three pins which allow you to interface with uh, an external coprocessor. Uh, those pins are the coprocessor instruction pin, which is an output from the CPU. Um, the coprocessor absent pin, which is a message from the coprocessor to the CPU to say that the coprocessor exists. And the coprocessor busy pin, which allows the coprocessor to tell the CPU that it is currently busy with a, another operation. And roughly the way this works is there are some instructions in the ARM instruction set which are designated as coprocessor instructions. Um, when one of those is hit, the CPU itself doesn't interpret the instruction, but it just flags on the CPI pin that it is currently looking at a coprocessor instruction. The coprocessor is then also sharing the data bus, probably not the address bus, but definitely the data bus, and the coprocessor can then read from the data bus what that instruction is um, and execute it um, and use the CPA and CPB pins to tell the CPU that it's happy to do so um, and to make sure the CPU waits for it to finish before carrying on. <laughs> 
Finally, along the top row here are miscellaneous bus control pins that I just stuck all together in one header. Uh, these are not necessarily all together on the um, CPU pin out itself. I've routed them around into these groupings to make my life easier when I'm using the board. So starting from the right hand side, um, the rightmost pin here is a byte versus word pin, I believe. Um, and what this does is, is that it indicates during a bus access cycle whether the CPU wants to access a full 32 bits of memory, a word, or whether it only wants to access an 8-bit byte. And if this pin is high, then it means that the CPU wants to access a word. And in this condition, the uh, bottom two bits of the address bus are ignored. And then the ARM expects the all 32 bits of the data bus to be filled in with whatever values came from memory at that address. So the bottom, I think it's little endian uh, in this revision. Uh, so the bottom eight bits are the first byte at the uh, address listed. And the next eight bits are the value of the next byte up. Um, the address plus one, uh, and so on up to the top bytes, up to the top bits there. And this is how the ARM is always set up when it's reading opcodes. Um, all opcodes have to be 32-bit aligned, and any 32-bit memory accesses also have to be 32-bit aligned. If the right-hand pin here is low, then it indicates that the bus is in byte mode, and that works a bit differently. So the way that works on a read access is actually exactly the same. So the address bus will indicate uh, with all of the pins except the bottom two pins which uh, word of memory needs to be accessed. And the bottom two pins will be set to indicate which byte from that word the ARM is interested in reading. Generally speaking though, the memory system will actually just read all four bytes of the word and provide all of the data here. And the ARM just reads from whichever byte of the word it is actually interested in, it handles that internally. So there's nothing that the memory circuit has to do to kind of route, for example, the bottom eight bits of the data bus to whichever specific byte the ARM was accessing. You can just treat it like a 32-bit read uh, and the ARM will do the rest. The only reason you might want to use the bottom two bits there is if you want to do some power saving or something, perhaps by not activating some of your, some of your RAM chips. On write operations, on the other hand, uh, those bottom two bits are very relevant because the ARM doesn't want to write all four bytes of memory that would be addressed from the address bus. So those two bits, of bottom, so those bottom two bits of the address bus then indicate which of the four bytes of memory should get written. And it's very important that you only enable write enable for the uh, the byte in question. You don't write all four of those bytes to memory. Moving on, the next pin along here is a read versus write pin. Um, this is this works exactly like it does on the 6502, except it's inverted. So in this case, um, the 6502 is high for reads and low for writes. Uh, on the ARM, this pin is low for reads and high for writes. And that just indicates whether the uh, CPU wants to do a read or write operation to the bus. The next pin along is an abort pin. Um, this is out of all these pins, this is the only one that's an input to the CPU. And it's a signal from the memory controller that the address being accessed is invalid in some way. Uh, it may be that there's actually no memory map to that address at all. It may be that the uh, user application doesn't have access to that memory or there's no page table entry for that memory. It might be trying to execute from non-executable memory or write to read only memory or anything like that. Um, in any of these conditions, the memory controller can tell the CPU that it was an invalid access, and that generates a kind of exception on the on the CPU, which is treated a bit like an interrupt. Uh, next is a signal called MREC for memory request, and that just indicates whether the CPU is currently interested in doing some bus activity. So we don't do any memory reads or writes unless that pin is low. It's an active low pin. Um, I guess reads wouldn't matter too much unless there are side effects to the read. This is in contrast to something like the 6502, which really has no way to indicate that it's not interested in what's on the bus on a particular cycle. Most of the time the 6502 is doing things with the bus, but there are some opcodes on the 6502 which have kind of idle cycles in the bus. Um, and certainly on some early 6502s, that actually caused a bunch of problems because they could read or sometimes write to random addresses and this would cause havoc if 
a random read happened from an I.O. address, for example. Um, sometimes it would also double read an I.O. address, um, which, which is bad if the read could have side effects, for sure. On the WDC 6502s, they actually fixed a bunch of these things by making it read the opcode instead of reading from whichever memory address it was accessing before then, which kind of fixes some of those problems, but certainly in the early days, people had to design around that. Next along here, we have an OPC pin that stands for opcode. Um, this is active low as well, and that just indicates whether the CPU is currently fetching an opcode from the bus. Very simple, it's just the same as the sync pin on the 6502, but backwards again. The next one along is called SEC for sequential access. This one's active high, and this goes high if the next address being fetched from the address bus is going to be either the same as the previous address or four bytes greater than the previous address. And the reason for this is, again, the Acorn engineer's obsession with uh, optimizing for memory bandwidth. Um, when you're using dynamic memory, when you fetch from one byte of memory, the memory chips are actually left in a state where it's relatively cheap for them to continue to access further data from the same region of memory. Um, it's only when you change pages of memory that you have to go through a full uh, row address change and that adds more time to the access cycle. So the Acorn engineers fi figured they could get better bandwidth out of their memory if the CPU gave the memory controller some hints as to whether the next read was from a sequential address, which would allow it to avoid having to do the whole row, ad row address strobe cycle. The next pin along uh, from there is a translate pin, uh, and this indicates whether the uh, memory controller should apply a logical to physical address translation to the requested address. Uh, that's just there to deal, to allow uh, kind of multitasking operating systems uh, to implement paged memory and so on. Uh, and the last two pins along there are mode pins, and they indicate what mode the CPU is in. Uh, the CPU has four modes. Uh, one is the supervisor mode, which is fairly self-explanatory, I think. Another is the user mode, which is the kind of restricted mode for generally running applications. And the other two modes are an IRQ mode for when it's handling an IRQ and an FIQ mode for when it's handling an FIQ, a fast IRQ. And these two pins, uh, you don't have to do anything with them, uh, but your memory controller could, for example, use them to apply additional memory protections. 